Hey, Monday, August 12th, 2024. Getting back from the gym. I've started going back after a, after a COVID, uh, you know, after this whole COVID recovery. So, yeah. Yeah, I'll just uh, go around the track here and then I'll make a loop back home. You know, so, yeah, the baby recovered faster than all of us and you know, now she has natural immunity. I think I mentioned this before. And, um, and then uh, I, my wife recovered really quick, but I, uh, I don't know, I, I didn't have fever, but I was like tired and lost my sense of taste and I had a blocked nose for the last two weeks or so. But now it's gone, I'm smelling everything. You know, I won't tell you how I got my sense of smell back, but put two and two together, we got a baby, you know, so, you know, who just started eating solid food. You know, so, that, yeah, there's a, so yeah, just put it all together. I think I dropped enough hints. So what's been happening last few weeks? Um, so my friend Sergey messaged me last night and he's in Kursk. <laughs> I, I couldn't believe it. You know, uh, he was like a, uh, office guy in Odessa and now he told me sent me a video that he's operating a machine gun in Kursk and he's 44 45 years old no prior military experience you know he was drafted at age 42 and since his English was really good he was translating you know manuals and everything from English to Ukrainian and now he's yeah he's on the He's right up there on the front, dead bodies and everything. He's seeing it all. You know, he, we were all talking on Viber last night. I have to raise some money. And if I can't raise it, I'll just spend my own to get him his night vision. It looks like they need night vision up there. You know, so, yeah. Yeah, so, uh, I don't know. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's a lot to... Uh, lot to think about you know it's uh you know a lot um yeah it's your own friends you know and everything it really uh you know i already have a brother-in-law but he's like uh 20 years experienced you know i don't worry about him so much he knows how to stay alive but <laughs> but uh sergey is a you know you know two years experienced and mostly in the office so we got to keep him alive and you know my worry about this uh, curse thing is right now you know Ukraine is doing really well and I think I think they're going for the nuclear plant I'm not sure I've seen all kinds of news on different theories about this I mean it's definitely a psychological blow to the Russians you know it definitely de definitely sh uh, shook things up there but um, I don't know how long it's gonna stay quiet and I don't know if this is a raid or the Ukrainians are digging in. I saw some reports they're digging trenches and, you know, maybe they're going to use this as a bargaining chip. But uh, one interesting observation was that there are a lot of like uh, Russian civilians fleeing the area. And I don't, I gave this some thought. I don't think they're fleeing uh, because the Ukrainians are invading. They're fleeing because they know when the Russians do a counterattack, you know, they don't care. They're going to bomb all the civilians to get the Ukrainian soldiers. So if there's like five Ukrainian soldiers hiding out in a, you know, in some apartment building or in some residential area, the Russians will use a vacuum bomb and kill 100 of their own to get five Ukrainians. And I think that's why the Russians were fleeing. Because at first I was thinking, why would they be fleeing? They, they should be asking for asylum in Ukraine. And through Ukraine, if you're like Russian, you can get asylum in Europe, I think. I'm not sure if they're giving asylum to Russians or not, but I think they could get, uh, they would definitely get a better life in Ukraine than they have in that part of Russia. I mean, that's not Moscow or St. Petersburg. You know, that's just like Russian villages. I mean, they're lucky to have washing machines. You know, so, um, but yeah, now, now to think about it, they're, they're fleeing because, you know, the Russian counterattack you know, it'll probably come in two weeks or so. I don't know how long it'd take for them to react to this. But uh, they're going to scorch the earth. You know, and, uh, you know, it's, it's going to be, I mean, it's definitely a diversion. It's going to take the Russians off their priority um, goals and, 
now they're on the back foot but it, this is this is not a video game you know this is like people's lives and everything but you know it's like yeah i i don't know i don't even want to imagine what the rest of this is going to be be like i mean i hope i hope the ukrainians have the main units tied down in in donbass and you know in kherson and all these other areas that they got them you know occupied there that the russians maybe just let this go for a while um but who knows who knows i mean um the reprisals against the Wagner, I mean, they were so-so. I mean, Putin took out uh, Prigozhin, you know, blew up his airplane. But uh, this is going to require, I mean, I'm, the numbers are like thousands of soldiers. So, I mean, it's going to counterattack on the Russian side. is going to be a lot of soldiers. They're going to have to be properly equipped, you know, and then they're going to have to dodge HIMARS and all this attack of missiles, you know, hitting the logistics points you know so I don't know it's gonna be an interesting next couple of weeks and I'm just uh, hoping my friend can survive all this you know I was uh, just giving him pointers that you know you guys and I don't know you're, you're like in a honeymoon phase right now but uh, they've got to come up with some you know watch schedules or something and hopefully hopefully we can get them some night vision so they can see in the dark, you know, and say, you know, like this, you know, cause not all the units uh, have night vision. Like, you know, it's like usually the professional, you know, units will get all the good equipment. And then like the units that are full of draftees are, you know, getting, you know, less stuff. You know, it's like any, even in the US military, there's shortages of equipment and, you know, you gotta prioritize and, make those hard decisions who gets and who doesn't get and you know who's uh who's fighting naked basically and who's not i mean those are just those are some of the difficult decisions a commander has to make and then they have to live with it for the rest of their life it's uh it's not easy but um yeah i, I hope this uh i don't know i don't think this will provoke a coup in russia i mean thing with Putin is like his inner circle has been his inner circle since since he was 25 years old out of the uh, KGB Academy you know and uh, he's he does his purges and everything and you know they all snitch on each other so I, I don't know if it's a uh, you know it's uh, such a it's like Kim Jong-un you know that kind of a uh, circle versus like Saddam Hussein Saddam Hussein and his sons were sold out you know, when they put a, a price on their head, the U.S. government put a price on their head, they were sold out by their own uh, relatives, you know, <laughs> you know, so, but I don't think it works like that with, uh, with uh, Putin, unfortunately. But yeah, all I, all I can say is I, I hope this gives Ukraine a good negotiating position and maybe there won't be this uh, dreaded counterattack. Maybe the Russians are already too tied up in their priority regions. You know, but uh, I wouldn't be so optimistic, you know. And like I said, I don't think they're even going to spare their own civilians in that region. They're probably going to blame them for not uh, fighting with kitchen knives and stuff, you know, that they uh, betrayed Russia because, you know, they didn't, uh, they didn't put up a fight with their pitchforks and, you know, kitchen utensils. You know, that's probably going to be the uh, line of reasoning. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah, it's... Uh, yeah, it's, uh, you know, we're living in a soap opera here in a, in a way that we don't know what's happening one day to the next, and every day is a surprise, and, you know, it's, uh, it's a tragic one, you know, and it's like real life one. So, yeah, yeah, um, I guess on to the election, you know, we, we've seen Kamala Harris turn it around, and as I said in the previous video, I'm completely predicting that she's gonna she's gonna win this it's very easy for the democrats to win actually you know um all they have to do is promise a whole bunch of free stuff you know i you know i'm trying not to use explicitives you know uh i think that gets your videos downvoted or something but you just promise a bunch of free stuff to people in the inner city you know people of low income low education and you just make a whole bunch of promises and uh, 
and then you get Taylor Swift or and some you know A-list musicians to sing about all the free stuff they're going to get, they'll turn up and vote. You know, um, you know, if the economy was such doom and gloom, Trump would even be uh, up ten points in the most uh, rigged polls. But it's not. You know, I mean, I'm. I'm following the stock market and economy every day as well. That's like, uh, you know, my, there's not much to do around here. You know, the curfew's at 10 o'clock. So uh, outside fitness, do a lot of reading on current events and the economy and everything. It's, it's tough. You know, housing is uh, expensive, you know, and a lot of things are, are tough, but it's not, a, it's not an impossible situation. It's not uh, 1979. You know, I remember that. I remember standing, you know, sitting with my mom in a car waiting to get gasoline. I remember the gas lines. I remember the 10% unemployment. Uh, you know, I remember, you know, my dad meeting a lot of hostility for being Indian, you know, and stuff like this, you know, when we were young. So, you know, it's, uh, hey, hey, Jaleel. Hey, how are you? You gotta come to Jaleel's shop. <laughs> very yeah, very good. I come back for fruits. Mm. Yeah. YouTube. Yeah, YouTube telling everyone what's happening. <laughs> Olympics. <laughs> All right then. So we'll see you. Bye bye. Yeah, that's Jaleel. Yeah, the Olympics. Yeah. I'll get to the Olympics at the end. Um, but yeah, for for Harris, this is this is easy. She's got. $300 million uh, war chest, or I think she even has more than that. She raised that much by herself when she, uh, you know, had the nomination passed to her. And, you know, I'm not happy about it. I wish they had some democratic process where we could have her and Gavin Newsom and Gretchen Whitmer and a few others duke it out to see who could, who could uh, carry the torch. I mean, it was anything but democratic. It was just all decided. And now they're putting all the money behind her and you know, like like I said, it's just uh, it's just a no-brainer for them to win. You know, uh, you know the, the the Trump side doesn't have a campaign strategy. You know, the last time when Trump won, he had this uh, guy Steve Bannon, who was actually like uh, you know a Harvard Business School graduate and an expert at analytics, and he was able to find the um, counties in America. He narrowed down to the counties. Where Trump had to spend his effort and and you know switch three thousand people, you know that election was decided by a few thousand votes, you know getting into the mind of a few undecided people and flipping them, you know, and now Trump doesn't have any of this. He's just surrounded by his family and yes men, and uh, he goes off script. You know he even said that in one of his speeches, that you know a speechwriter wrote a great speech and he starts going off script. You know, and I don't know, talking about Kamala Harris being black or Indian, she's both. It's possible to be both. It's like my kid, you know, like I have Indian DNA and my wife has Ukrainian DNA. So my uh, kid is like Indian and Ukrainian by genetics and American and Ukrainian and Norwegian by citizenship. So it's possible to, to be both. You know, I, I don't know if Trump understands that, but... Uh, black person and a white person get married, the kid can be both black and white. You know, like, like I'm brown and my wife is white, my kid came out white. That's like a big lottery when you're Indian, you know, to have, <laughs> have your kid with light skin. You know, it uh, increases their chances of success in life. But uh, <laughs> anyway, I don't want to go down that road too much. A lot of it also is to, up to her and well, how much effort she makes at life. But uh, in India, it's definitely an advantage to be more fair-skinned. It's like Brazil or any other place, Africa even. But uh, yeah, yeah. So that I don't know if uh, I don't know if Trump gets that memo, but uh, he's got to. If he's going to win, he's got to. Uh, like I said, he can't rely on no shows. You know, I, I think Kamala Harris watches my videos because she's going to get high voter turnout. You know. Um, I guess at a uh, Taylor Swift concert two weeks before the election, you know, singing about all the free stuff. Yeah, that'll, that'll get 99% of the Democratic voters to show up. 
you know, and uh, that'll, that'll be a disaster for the Trump side. So the Trump side needs to convert people. You know, he can't keep uh, doubling down on his base. You know, his base at most is only 46% of the uh, U.S. Uh, population. And in the swing states like Wisconsin um, and Pennsylvania, he already lost the Michigan swing state vote. You know, Michigan was on the edge, but now it looks like Michigan is clearly in Harris's uh, column. You know, so, you know, and usually Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin always vote the same. So, uh, all these people like saying it's a conspiracy and, you know, it's rigged. It's not. It really isn't. Trump is uh, just, uh, uh, Trump is good at making speeches, but uh, he's bad at, uh, at campaign strategy. He's bad at uh, talking about the right things. His speeches are great. They're entertaining. But uh, you really don't understand, you know, as a middle class person or upper middle class person, you don't really understand where you stand with his policies. Like right now, the perception is he's just going to give tax breaks to billionaires. And then we just have to hope those billionaires are going to be nice enough to, you know, give us, you know, on their own accord, health insurance and, you know, vacation and all this stuff. Of course they're not. They're all sociopaths. You know, that's why we have to have a government to, uh, you know, keep them in check. Otherwise, they would just make us work seven days a week, 15 hours a day. And any time we uh, rise up, they would... Uh, use thugs to squash us down. I mean, that's why the U.S. government formed, you know, to, uh, you know, give power to the people versus to the corporations or to uh, monarchs, oligarchs, you know, now in modern, modern day term as billionaires, you know, so, yeah, Trump has to, uh, has to convey his points. I mean, there's a lot of stuff I like in the platform. I like the traditional family values. I don't like the woke, but, uh, you know, I think for a lot of Americans, that's not a deciding factor. And for me, like I said, I'm really undecided right now. I think in the last video I said I shifted from Biden to undecided because what worries me about Harris, you know, and she hasn't made a news conference, but, you know, then again, she doesn't need to. She has a Democratic machine behind her. You know, she has this whole $300 million and, you know, all these people knocking on doors and doing this ground war, you know, um, you know systematically, methodically. To get those votes but uh, she's very uh, and I'm not crazy about Israel you know and I, I feel for the Palestinian people but if she shifts the balance in the Middle East where she's favoring a, a Palestinians and you know being seen as like a easy on Hamas Israel might just uh, you know stop listening to us and go nuclear on their own right now you know we have to hold them back you know and it's a, that's a hard job especially for a democratic president. And that could, uh, that could ignite a whole war in the Middle East and everything. It's a very tough coalition they have there. You know, we have the Jordanians on our side, the Saudis so-so on our side and everything, you know, to keep Iran in a box. And if um, Harris gets in there and starts disrupting things and Israel starts uh, attacking, that, that whole thing could fall apart. It's like a big Jenga pile. So, yeah, it's a lot to think about. You know, um, Trump, obviously, the concerns are on Ukraine. But, you know, the, like I said, the, I see some promise in the Boris Johnson plan. I, I, I'm of the camp that we have to get some agreement on this war soon because if this thing drags out eight, ten years like Vietnam, you know, or like Afghanistan, we've seen how that ends. There, there's like a lot of fatigue at the end and then the U.S. just ends up abandoning the country. Everyone is worn out. You know, the whole sentiment has changed. People are tired about hearing about it, you know. So I don't think a 10-year war, you know, we're already two and a half years in, you know, so another eight years of this. You know, if we have two, admin two Harris administrations, you know, she wins back to back, you know, uh, you know, which is, like I said, is very possible, you know, the changing demographics in America, you know, it's, uh, and there'll be fatigue. And her priority, like, is going to be on the Middle East. And then you also have this China-Taiwan thing. You know, so I'm of the school. Ukraine better, you know, get 80%, 90% of its country back, you know, or keep 80%, 90% and get a security agreement and rebuild and get the economy going. And, you know, just uh, wait it out till Putin dies, 
like we waited out the Soviet Union and get it back because if we go 10 years if this war keeps going 10 years just based on history just based on the history of like past US wars like Iraq they just left it alone Afghanistan they just left it alone you know they just uh, get fatigued and leave like South Vietnam it's only in Korea that had a pleasant outcome you know and, and Korea gave up half the country and uh, or I guess with East and West Germany also you know that was a case study where we had two Germanys and then the Soviet Union fell and now there's one Germany and NATO inherited the Baltics and most of Eastern Europe NATO was able to go eastward you know in the process and I think that's what people here are very impatient you know they want instant gratification they've grew, grown up in this uh, you know digital age where everything happens instantly where you get your dopamine hits uh, quickly you know everything is gamified but uh, war and history don't work that way things move at like a snail's pace and and there's many other factors than just getting land back you know uh, if they, like I said if they go eight ten years with the sole goal of getting all the land back and the economy gets destroyed in the process and uh, you know sentiment is already on the edge in Europe you know the Russians have infiltrated a lot of the political parties you know, and I think the Iranians are getting in on that too, you know, through social media. You know, it's like a, it's a different uh, battle space now. And, uh, yeah, it's just, uh, people have got to talk about this stuff. You know, they've got to, like, peel back the onion a little bit and talk about all the different layers involved here and all the different things. I mean, I want to see Ukraine reunified. I want to see Ukraine beat Russia. But there's, like, different ways to do this, you know, and uh, smart ways to do it because... We definitely have to get the economy going here. We have to get this airport reopened. We have to get the investment in here and then get some immigration going to get the population up so that we can you know, build a proper army. We have a proper uh, pool to draw from you know, to get a, a massive army. Ukrainian army needs to be like the second biggest army in the world after the American one. You know, it's, uh, it's gotta be like absolutely massive. You know, and it's got to be like a military culture like they have in Israel. You know, a lot of, a lot of things have to happen here. And it can't happen if, you know, if the economy is not, uh, you know, the economy is being hindered because insurance companies won't uh, cover airline flights. You know, if we keep, you know, that's the number one thing holding the airport from reopening. It's not the Russian missile attacks, but the perception from insurance companies. You know, they will not insure anything. And like, I, I've talked to a guy in Norway. He has a building company. He's got a whole bunch of contracts lined up, but nothing can happen until the war is over because nobody wants to build projects that they perceive will get bombed. And insurance companies won't insure those projects. So, yeah, that's the, that's the pickle we're in. Um, what else we got going on here? Olympics. Yeah. Yeah, so it was, I watched the basketball. You know, that's uh, in the Javelin was interesting because like India was uh, involved there. We saw Pakistan win the gold medal. The guy blew it out of the water. He didn't just win it. He went 93 meters. That was interesting to see that the Javelin throw went from Eastern Europe. It was mostly dominated by the Czechs and Poland and countries like this to India and Pakistan. That's become their new thing. You know, it's like cricket, field hockey. You know, I think India got a bronze in the field hockey. They're, they're not strong enough to get the gold. It's like that's dominated by the Netherlands and Germany. They have like a better program management, I think, to uh, consistently get those medals. But uh, yeah, the U.S. basketball was interesting at Serbia. You know, they won that whole thing in the last six minutes. That was cool. And then France, that was a no-brainer. I watched that game, fell asleep. I mean, you saw where that was going. The U.S. like let France get the lead, and then they would, uh, you know, get get up five points, and then at the end they just turned on the defense and took a ten-point lead and won the game. It was like easy peasy for them. <coughs> you know, uh, now Olympic basketball is shorter. It's only forty minutes. You know, ten four uh, four ten-minute quarters. Where like um, I think NBA is like sixty minutes if I'm not mistaken, like goes a whole hour. So it's a different, it's a much faster game, you know, much more, you know, they're doing a lot of three point shots, but it's cool. It's nice to see America, you know, they tied it up 40 gold medals with China, 
and then they had more silver, so technically the U.S. wins the Olympics. First you go by the gold medal count, whoever has the most gold medals, and then if there's a tie, then you go down the silver medals and the bronze, etc. So, but yeah, China's becoming an Olympic power. A U.S., you know, fell back in swimming. We should have had another five medals in the swimming, you know, but uh, gold medals. So I, I don't know what's going on with the swimming program, but that was something the U.S. used to dominate like basketball. That used to be a no-brainer for America. So, but we'll see. You know, I guess the next one's in L.A. in 2028. Um, yeah, so that was that was cool. Yeah, it was cool. It was. Uh, I didn't care for the opening ceremony. Like I said, I thought that was pretty egregious. But I do enjoy, like I said, watching the the basketball. <laughs> it's always uh, fun to see how the different countries will, uh, you know, go against each other. Uh, but you know, my view on this uh, Serbia game was that they kind of let them have the lead because, like. Nobody wants to see the Americans just like up 50 points in the first quarter. Everyone will turn off the TV. So I think they were letting them have it. They seemed like they were, because if you look at the last six minutes, they just like something like they turned a switch. So it looks like they were in control the whole time. You know, they didn't get this motivational speech at halftime, you know, that, uh, you know, the USA is depending on them and all this stuff and do this for your country. And, you know, <laughs> they, they didn't get that. I think they just, uh, they just switched it on, you know. They turned on the defense and then started taking more, you know, came out of that deficit 15 points or something. You know, that, that was like, uh, you know, like you have what, uh, LeBron James and, uh, you know, what is it, uh, KD, Kevin Durant and Sean Curry. These are like the best players in the world. I mean, they were just uh, hitting baskets like nothing, you know. I mean, they were hitting three-pointers like they just turned it on. So it's like even, they, they, it's just amazing to see that. But anyway, long video today. That's all I got, and we'll see you later. Bye-bye.